Good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and get started. There's a few folks that are still rolling in. Looking forward to having them settle in as we just do some introductory statements. Uh, this is, as always, a GPN Technologies webinar where attendees will be in listen-only mode. That means that your audio microphone will be canceled out by us so we won't hear background noise. Uh, we may be taking some questions along the way, so if you want to use the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen, we will filter for relevant questions throughout the session and uh, take a look at which of those we might be able to answer. This webinar series from GPN Technologies has been called Next Steps, and the goal is to provide a practical roadmap to ECPs as they get back to business. This is the sixth session that has been hosted in the iThrive webinar series called Next Steps, and uh, today's title is The Reality of Reopening. I am once again your host, Scott Jens. I've got about uh, two decades plus of clinical practice experience until I uh, retired from the profession in 2018 and I'm now a executive business coach to the GPN Technologies team. It's my pleasure again to join, have us be joined by our featured expert, Dr. Lori Lipiat from Salem Eye Care Center in Ohio, which she founded in 1989. Um, she's been a repeat expert in our Next Step webinar series and brings a really thoughtful perspective on practicing eye care in these uncertain times. And it's great to have you with us once again, Lori, welcome. Thanks, Guy. So today we're going to talk about the realities of being in practice in this early phase of reopening. For those of you who have not yet opened, we think some of these learnings will be incredibly useful for you. Um, for those of you who are going through this, maybe taking a bit of time on your lunch hour uh, to listen in to this, or you're watching the recorded version of this session, we hope that you'll find that there are areas where we can bring some observations and probably uh, answer a bunch of questions. The topics today uh, we believe will cover leadership and taking care of yourself. We're going to talk about staff matters and we have a special guest with us for that. And then we'll try to get into a few other topics as time permits, including communicating with your patients. Now, we're going to start with leadership and taking care of yourself. And, you know, Lori, we've talked a lot lately, and you are spending a lot of energy, both physical and mental, to do what you do at times like this. You're seeing 10, 20 patients a day. Tell me about how you're feeling at the end of the day, how you're recharging. Let's, uh, let's hear how it's going. Thanks, Scott. Well, just as um, a quick overview, we stopped seeing patients full scale March 18th. So we went to emergency care, then essential care through April 30th, and then we started back into comprehensive care May 1st. So we're about almost three weeks into our comprehensive care um, schedule. And I'll tell you, it's, it's been a real learning experience. The first thing I will say is that we needed that time to get the office prepared to reopen to provide comprehensive care. We started by extending our hours, reducing our lunch time, and reducing staff. And I think we've talked about those things in, in past sessions. So uh, what's worked is that we needed the first couple of weeks to really work with a 30-minute schedule that worked very well, um, helping the staff orient to our new standards and protocols and procedures, um, training, disinfecting, sanitizing. The challenges that um, mm -hmm. I've observed is that this was more exhausting than I would have ever imagined. So um, by exhausting, even at a 30 I mean, minute schedule by the end of the day. Um, so I was used to seeing uh, way more patients than this. Let's just see, say three or four an hour. And we started out, I think the first day or the first week averaging about 14 patients a day. So quite a reduction in schedule and I was twice as tired. So looking back, I think that probably what I would say is I wasn't prepared for the emotional and physical challenge that this new type of schedule presented, as well as the amount of time of managing patients and staff, the, the, the difference in, in how we needed to manage patients and staff during this time. So it's been a challenge. Um, we have really some days resorted to the mentality of let's just 
think one patient at a time rather than look at the whole day as a daunting task. That seems to have helped. And then um, getting, making sure that we're, we're all, all of us are getting enough sleep and rest. But yeah, it's a, it's a different, it's a different world. Um, this week we have um, changed our schedule somewhat. We are seeing more patients this week. We're at about 18 to 20 a day this week. I didn't feel that we could have ever managed that the first couple of weeks. We definitely needed the much slower pace, but I'm sure we'll talk about that as the session proceeds. So you are still seeing those patients on 30 minute intervals, correct? So um, as we started at 30 minute incremental um, intervals, as everyone knows, then you run into challenges like difficult contact lens fits, you know, where if you're doing a comprehensive exam every 30 minutes and you need to see a patient back in a week or several days, where then do you place those patients? So we have had to really involve the entire staff, understand who the patients were on the schedule to allow extra patients to be placed onto the existing schedule, as well as as I mentioned, expanding our hours. So we're starting earlier in the morning, we're working later, and we've condensed our lunch time as well. So I talked to a practice this morning that started at 40 minutes, went to 30, and I think there's even a question here about aspirationally getting back to, if you will, normal schedule. Uh, before we go on to the next topic, let's just hit that. You talked about, again, the energy and effort it takes to see patients with these new protections in place, the sanitizing process. Um, while you're placing some extra patients in the schedule, how long do you think it'll take before you'll have the right number of factors line up that you'll be able to see patients on a, a more quick frequency? So we have gradually been bringing our furloughed staff back. Um, we started bare bones in the beginning with a front desk uh, team member, an optician, a pretester, and my office manager. So four support staff to me to what to, per doctor. We are now in the process of returning some staff as our optical dispensary has been getting busier. We returned another optician to the practice, et cetera. So, we are literally still in the phase of taking one day at a time and checking in with every team member every day in terms of how they're feeling, how overwhelmed they feel, et cetera. The other thing I might mention is some of the fatigue I believe that exists at the end of the day has been for me uh, wearing the N95 mask all day. So there are days with our schedule that I really don't have time to relieve myself from the mask. And I now am making a very concerted effort to make sure that I am doing that because I have noticed that um, it, it does seem to be adding to the problem. So let's shift a little bit. As a leader, of course, you have to see the patients, mm -hmm. but you also have to deal with various internal team business activities. You want to give us a little summary of what you're doing so the attendees can contrast that to what they're doing or what they plan to do? So what I have found is that the communication that needs to exist in this period of time is at least quadruple what you may have experienced in the past. We are, and, and Heather, my office manager, who will be joining us, will speak to this as well. We are doing check-ins, wellness check-ins, with <clears throat> each team member every day. Um, I don't remember, and I've been in practice 31 years, so I don't recall ever walking around the, staff, or the office and asking a staff member, how do you feel today? Are you feeling okay? Tell me what's going on. Um, it's, it's something as ODs we probably took for granted that we would hear if there was something not okay. So the check-ins have been imp uh, very important. We're also doing a combination of schedule management with all team members. So, you know, working with optical, working with office manager, working with front desk to understand the patients and the patient's needs on the schedule so that we can adopt and, and, and change a schedule to allow more spacing. 
So let's finish up this leadership and taking care of yourself topic by talking about taking care of yourself. You mentioned in a previous webinar or call you and I had that you're as exhausted at the end of the day as you've ever been, but you also are ready for the next day. And that involves some focused attention on yourself, which just like walking around and meeting the staff, I think some ODs haven't necessarily thought about. Sure, they might go for a run. Yes, they have kids' activities to attend to, but you really have to make an effort. Tell us what you're doing. Well, when all of this started, I knew that my office would only be as good as I was to lead it health-wise. So um, I have always been uh, very conscious of health, and in this period of time, my goal has always been to keep my body and my mind in what I call fighting shape. That means I know, for example, what I need to eat to feel good. And I know when, what I shouldn't eat that makes me not feel so good. This isn't, um, this isn't a fire drill. This is game time. So I have been very careful to maintain the quality of my diet that's essential for my well-being as well as scheduling physical exercise. That is something that I really believe is necessary, especially when we're wearing these masks a lot of the day, most of the day. And um, I just need to get outside and get some real oxygen every day and and also let my mind rest um by mind rest i mean that you will find that the, some days the stress is so high that you probably will wake up in the middle of the night and, and you know be thinking of different workflows or or whatever it's really important to learn how to control that and and let your mind rest so that you're capable of attacking the next day um, efficiently all right, well, thanks for those insights. Let's shift to the second topic, and this one's gonna occupy a big chunk of today's presentation. So, um, you know, this is the staffing management topic. It, throughout our webinar series, we've talked about having a safe and comfortable environment for patients and staff. And I'm sure that your staff feels, you know, some of those uncertainties still to be somewhat stressful. Are there some examples of things you've experienced with staff that you can share? And then our special guest is going to join us. So how about you first give us some insights from a leadership and staff perspective? Right, and I really appreciate the fact that um, Heather, my office manager, will be joining us. This has been a journey, and Heather has shared in that journey, and I think a lot of you will find her, her um, information to be very interesting because, as I have learned, every staff member has reacted and responded to the COVID-19 crisis differently just like the public has. Everybody is different, there's no right or wrong, and it's really important to respect um, everyone's view. And I think in the very first webinar we did early or mid-April, I said, fear is real, and for a lot of staff, it's still very real. So um, we have had cases where we've had staff that have been here for a while during this process who have completely melted down in the middle of a morning, gone back to an exam room and started crying for what I wouldn't have ever believed was any reason because they were with us this whole time. And um, only to come to find that that particular day, the situation was too overwhelming for them that day. So I've had to learn how to adapt to um, and be understanding and compassionate to different circumstances um, that have arisen that have never arisen in this practice before. And um, Heather, I've given Heather um, authorization to really talk openly and honestly with the questions you're going to ask her because these are very real things that did exist in our practice and I'm sure will exist in your practices if you haven't returned uh, to uh, comprehensive care. And for those of you that um, have experienced these things, you can be sure that you're not abnormal. <laughs> this is really going on. Well, here at GPN Technologies, we really have felt strongly that this webinar series brings unique perspectives. And, you know, we were dabbling a little bit around patient stories, the, the experiences of patients. 
but frankly, we think that's a little premature. So today we are inviting in the Salem Eye Care Center office manager, Heather. Hi, Heather. Welcome and uh, glad to have you here. Thanks for having me. I appreciate this time today. Well, we know how strapped your business is for your time, so we're grateful that you could join us. You know, at the beginning of this, you were pretty uncomfortable about being on site at the practice. Again, the clinic did not close at all. You guys stayed open for emergencies, taking patients that otherwise would not then have to go to the emergency room and such. And you started working from home initially because that's where you felt safe. And so let's talk a little bit about that mindset, about, you know, how you felt and how it was working from home and then what steps you and Dr. Lippiat took to get you comfortable to return. Well, this all happened so fast. I mean, for all of us, I don't, I know we never have protective face coverings here at the office. We had no PPE. We had no plan. It was scary. It was really scary. The media, your family, Facebook, any, anything they were, inundating us with information and it was very scary um i worked from home i had control of who was around me then i didn't have to worry about a stranger making sure i'm safe i know i'm safe at home and that was comforting to me i got to i got to work old ar i i did some things from home i came up with some game plans but dr Lippiat and i actually stayed in very close contact so we could develop a plan. She developed it mostly, but to get us back to feel safe again at the office. Can you tell me what the, uh, this, this, is, this is a question that just came to my mind. What was maybe the one thing as a staff person you wanted to hear from the doctor and the plan that made you go, all right, I, I think I'm starting to feel better. What, what, do, can you remember what that was? that we had a plan. Dr. Lippi, it's great with her plans and to have something and to actually follow through with it, but just having a, something on paper so you could look at it, understand it, question it, to just have a plan in itself was great. Wow, I mean, that's really meaningful because we have spoken throughout this webinar series about doctors developing one, and it's interesting to hear your perspective of how important that was. Now, after those few weeks, you know, Dr. Lippiat found that she was really going to need you back in the practice. And what emotions transpired when you got back there, right? You had this plan. What was that like when you went in that first day? Let's go back to before I went in. <laughs> Panic. There was a degree of panic. It's scary going back into a situation that you yourself, you're not in control of. Not that it's a bad plan. The plan's great, but it's scary because of all the news and, you know, your friends, your family, again, saying, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, this is so scary. We're all going to die kind of attitude. <laughs> I mean, it came to that. There's a lot of influences. Right, right. Right. And once you get back into it, and if you have a really good solid plan, I came back into the office and I felt good because one of the things doctors said, I could go work in my office in the basement and I didn't have to be around anybody, which was real nice. And that lasted about a day because when I came back to the office, everything was so organized and put in place and it was so comforting to actually see it. You can see it on paper, but to actually be there and experience the flow it was it was such a nice flow it was so comforting by the end of the first day i was upstairs and i was kind of around patients and i, I didn't feel uncomfortable at all so this comes to my mind as well you be regular communication and the effort to be visible that dr lippy had made that sort of helped you walk through it step by step but my guess is you you would encourage the doctors who are listening to our session to be as present as she was did that make that big of a difference it's huge. Um, Dr. Lippiat and I talk every morning. We sit down, we game plan, we discuss what's working, what's not working. Um, I can tell her things about the staff that the staff may not feel comfortable telling her, and then she can enforce it or we can make changes that makes, make the staff feel better. Uh, I myself discuss how the staff is feeling. Their emotional health is, is huge. You need to make sure they're safe. You need to make sure that they're comfortable, and if they're not, 
what can we do to make it better so you feel efficient working and safe for your what you're taking home to your family and that we have a good day well let's dig in a little bit more on that how do you convey your level of confidence to your team members in other words you have gotten comfortable. There were people that were actually working side by side with Dr. Lipiat when you were at home, right? There's different people have different, you know, in, insights and feelings. Um, you talked about these regular check-ins. Talk about what that looks like in the practice. Can you tell us an example of something that's happening between you and a or more than one other staff person? Well, we just keep in touch with each other. Oh, there you are. Um, we have a plan, we have a workflow, and we follow that workflow. We do what we say we're going to do. And by doing that and in talking with the staff before they're coming back, if they were furloughed, or I just, I've become more of an advocate than being afraid. Because it's such, it's a good workflow, it works, and I don't feel unsafe at work. I'm comfortable here. And that's what I tell the girls. Sometimes even though I'll say, just come. You'll feel so much better. Get an hour under your belt. You need to see it, how it works and how the flow is. And with one of my staff members that's a little bit more upset than maybe another, she's been, oh yeah, this isn't bad. Just as long as they have a mask, that's what she says. Just as long as they have a mask, I'm good. And, and that's been helpful to them. That's awesome. So I want to talk a little bit about the idea that you are operating with a reduced staff, which means you each have a lot more to do, right? And you talked a little in a conversation we had preparing for this webinar about we all have these titles and it's all hands on deck and regardless of titles, we have to do what we have to do. Please give the listeners a little bit of insight from your reality perspective on having to do what you have to do. Some days we're in survival mode. We just have to get through the day. I'm the office manager. Does that mean I don't check patients in? No, I do what I need to do. I do, if I'm checking patients in, I'm dispensing a pair of glasses. I'm solving a problem for an employee. I walk by the, the, one of the exam rooms the patient has just been in, and I see Dr. Lippy wiping the chair down with alcohol or disinfectant or Clorox wipes, whatever she has in her hand at the time. And I think we really need to get away from, because I'm the doctor, I can't, or because I'm the optician, I can't. No, if you wanna be successful, everybody needs to work as a team. I mean, that's the only way it's really gonna get done. No, I, I don't have to answer the phone, but of course I'm gonna answer the phone. We're a team, we're a group, we're a core group of people that are trying to be successful and help patients. I remember one time when our practice was getting bigger and I hadn't answered the phone like I had in the early days, and there was some circumstance that got me to answer the phone. And A, it reminded me how um, important that fronting of the practice is to somebody who's inquiring or, you know, making a, an inbound call, but also how, you know, how many people do it every minute of the day. And this must remind you of sort of those small and what we consider trivial things have to be done in the course of a day. The list must be endless. I mean, including taking out the trash. Oh, right. It's, I, it's ridiculous, but we have to do it. I mean, we're, we're definitely keeping the office clean. We always were. But now it's when somebody uses the pen, it goes in the bin that you have to disinfect the pens at the end of the day to put them back in the pen holder so everybody gets a clean, fresh pen. And as soon as everybody, you know, you, a patient walks into the office, if you saw video one, the patient walks into the office, and once that patient sits down, you know, they touch the counter we wipe it. They get out of the chair, we wipe it. We wipe the rails, we wipe the front door, the back, the outside, the inside, and everywhere they go, we follow them around with disinfectant wipes, basically. I mean, they don't see it, but, you know, that's what we're doing. We, we need to keep safe. So. so you have this comparatively smaller staff than when you were full bore, um, and you've had to manage some situations with your staff where they call out, uh, they're ill or they just can't come in for one reason or another. Um, talk a little bit about some of the examples that you had to deal with because, again, everyone listening, you get that plan to get back, and then as soon as you get back, there's a change to that plan, right? Some challenge to that plan. What have those situations looked like? Um, there's been tears, <laughs> there, but 
we have to develop a core group of, of people. Now the core group of people started with two while I was at home and we added on, we subtracted, we added, but there's a core group in this, when you're in a situation like this, this is where you figure out who your true core is. And you need to have that core. Um, we were plugging away, we had a plan, you know, tomorrow's Tuesday, we're going to go with our plan and then someone's sick. And everybody rotates, everybody switches. I'm checking patients in. Front desk is pre-testing, optician's still opticianing, but and answering the phone more. And it just puts so much more stress on everybody. I mean, we've all experienced it when we were working in a normal setting, but it's just like experiencing it on steroids because it's just over the top. It's frustrating, it's maddening. And, and you're not mad, but you just have to really pull it together. And one of the things that we're doing, and we're always nice to each other, we're being a little bit more kind. This is a struggle. It's hard. <laughs> Every day is a struggle. But everyone's being kind and nice a little bit more. And it's helping. I mean, it's it's just helping. <laughs> you know, I used to mention in the clinic that you set up a staffing level and assume that about you're about 10% understaffed most of the year, just because of vacation and unplanned situations. And it's easy in a clinic where everyone's kind of upon each other and dependent on each other. that when you have to share the load of somebody who's not there, you can get frustrated. And, you know, that can come out in the form of some back channel chats and some things that don't bubble up to the doctor. As the office manager, are you tr driving that niceness? Are you sort of putting it right out there that, hey, we need to be more compassionate than maybe we've ever been? You know, do you think that'll last then as this thing hopefully gets behind us that people will be a little bit more accommodating to their coworkers? Just give me some thoughts about how you're managing that. Well, actually, they've been fantastic. They've really stepped up. I don't have to tell anybody to behave or be nice. They've just wow. done it. And we've always just done it. Um, we're just doing it a little differently this time. We all know we're all in pain, not physical pain, but we're just all struggling. For example, we were talking about the schedule. Usually we do that with six or seven people in a day. Now we're down to three and we've been so busy with the phones. People want to get in. They want to get back to life as they knew it. Um, so that's why it's such a struggle. I don't have to be, I am the cheerleader at times and we'll get through this, we'll do it, we'll do it. But they've been great. The staff has been amazing and they've been that core group. We're adding to this core now with people coming back off a of furlough. And I just do hope that it continues. I think it will because it's always been, but it's just been a little sweeter now. Well, uh, you are, you, you, your practice is an example of how a culture is fostered. It just doesn't get let to happen. And so it's no surprise that people have been kind. And I think the message to our attendees is if you haven't had a practice like that, it starts with number one. And, you know, every employee after number one needs to sort of make a, a new commitment. I think this is a great time to make a new commitment. And so when we think about commitments, we talked to Dr. Lipiat about the impacts in her personal life, and what she's had to do. You must feel uh, exhausted at times. Is work stress spilling over into your personal life? H how are you doing to manage now that you've been back at it? I go to bed at eight o'clock at night. I never go to bed at eight o'clock at night. No, my actual family is, they've made comments. Um, I'm no uh, Julia Child, but they're on their own for dinner. Um, I'm tired, I'm exhausted. <laughs> And it's not because I'm running around more at the office. It's mental and physical. I, you know, you wake up in the middle of the night and you're like, oh no, wait, if we change this, this could happen and we could see another patient a day or, or I wonder how someone says feeling emotionally or, you know, somebody's parents sick or, and then you just don't sleep. The stress of the beginning of it, you didn't sleep and the stress of being restarting, you're not sleeping either. It's just, my family wants me back and we're all gonna get back. Um, we just need to get back to normal, start enjoying the things that we did and it's slowly coming around. It's just gonna take some time. 
you've given some real reassuring words that once people come in and try it for a bit, they, you know, get reassured of their safety and then they start to see, you know, some of the things they're familiar with, they get back at it. That's, that, that's reassuring, at least to me. Let's talk about bringing some of that staff back. You, you've been ramping it back a little bit. Um, you had this reduced work staff and I'm guessing that while the plans are constantly changing, you are again working under a plan could you give us a little bit of a sense of what that looks like as you are bringing a person back here and there it's keeping it's communication and dr lippy and i have an awesome communication network and it trickles down i try to communicate with the girls that are off um the ones that were off i i touch base with them once a week um when they're coming back i ask them if they have any questions i kind of go over i went over we just had one come back this week we went over it over the phone. And then when she came in on Monday uh, to a different schedule than she's used to doing, which has been changing as well. Everybody's schedules are constantly fluid anymore. Um, we, we walked around the office and I showed her the things that had changed. Um, she was super comfortable. I checked back with her later in the day and asked how she was feeling. Was there anything that she did not like, she liked, anything that stuck out? We have uh, air fuel for filtration systems in the office now and that's a real help and it actually is right next to her desk so she really likes it but we've just done so many things to the office to make the staff feel safe and she was totally happy about being back to work so i understand you're doing well in practice metrics i know you're working longer hours with shorter right. lunches um, tell me about your performance. You know, uh, are you guys sharing updates with the staff? Are you performing well as well as you think you should? Yes, we're doing better than we think we should. I, we're doing amazing, and it's, I'm surprised. Um, not because of how we work, but because we weren't sure how it was going to happen. I mean, everything from the beginning to right now has been just ever-changing. Um, one of the things that I would really suggest is look at, really look at your schedule. You can look at your schedule all day long, but if you look at it hard to see the patients that you don't think are going to show up because we're scheduling 30 minutes apart. And if one person doesn't come, that's an hour. So I know that sounds so elementary, but it's an hour. So if you really drill down to how many times has this patient, patient not come to the office? Have you been able to confirm them and a host of other things? Um, maybe put somebody near there. So you, you're not losing that whole hour. It, it's just helpful. How, how are the patients themselves feeling when they get there? Are, are you building proper levels of comfort and a feeling of safety there? How, how are they talking about what they experience? They are real comfortable. I've checked in with several of them, especially right in the beginning. And I will just frankly go up and say, how was your visit today? How did you feel in the office? Did you feel comfortable? Was there anything in that you feel like we need to change to raise that level, level of comfort? And everyone has been happy. We've had the mayor here. We've had um, an administrator from the maintenance department at the hospital that keeps the hospital clean here. We've had so many people, physicians, and they're like, you guys have it going on. You are clean in here. We feel safe in here. We're happy to be here. We wish other places were like this. That's a great compliment. Um, there was a question that came in. I'd like you to address it. And it was related to uh, the optical part of the business. Uh, as the office manager, I know you and Dr. Lippiat and the people in the optical have created you know, great plans with partitions and things. Um, when you talk about patient comfort, right, at some point, trying on frames of masks, we've covered this a little bit, but tell us from your perspective how your optical team is dealing with patients over there. Just give everyone that's in attendance an update of the practicalities. Are there ever points in, in which you allow patients to take off their masks to try on frames? And if so, what does that look like? Just give us a brief summary there. Well, it's amazing out in optical. The girls have been great. We make everyone we always have someone with a mask on. We, we make them come in, wear a mask. If they don't have one, we give them one. But you don't want to try on a frame with the mask on because you don't know what you really look like. So we, doctor purchased these um, shields. I'm not sure the exact name that she would call them, but they sit on the optical desk. And once several frames or the optician has picked them out for the patient, 
the patient can sit behind this clear shield, uh, similar to like the shields we have in our front windows, and they can take their mask off and actually try on the frames right there in the mirror without any obstruction from the mask. And then Great. once that's done, we put it in a bin and then we wash the glasses, then we retag the glasses, then we put them all back out. It's a process. That's why we're so tired. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> One other thing that I'd like to ask you around your team is that you are doing certain tests of, of your employees' wellness. Um, and I guess I wonder, and a, a question came in, if somebody were to test positive, do you have a plan for that? Or will you and Dr. Lipiat have to sort of think about that when it would happen? Well, we ask everyone to take their temperatures at home before they come in. So I can only assume if they come to work with a temperature, since everybody lives like five minutes from the office, that they probably didn't do it. Um, at that point, I would just contact her if she wasn't in. She's usually here before any employees, um, as well as myself. We would probably just get, her, get them out of there. We haven't, everybody's been checking their temperature, and we do it again when we get to the office, just that so we have log that we've done it. Um, we haven't had anybody sick. And I'm not sure what, I'm sure we would just get in contact and deal with it yeah. at the moment. One other practical question is, you know, you talked about a very important item around keeping the schedule full and the dependency you have on, on patients showing up as opposed to no showing. Um, have you put any extra resources in your team? I know you don't, you're running on sort of a skeleton crew, but are you doing more phone calls, uh, more efforts to do confirmations, or are you using a pretty standard system uh, that has had, you know, baked in success before? Anything that part of the process in the, in the clinic with your team? Well, we absolutely have made some changes. Um, we have a, a system in place that makes automatic recalls for us, and that's helpful, but it doesn't have any change as far as saying, make sure you wear PPE to the office. So we take two days ahead of time, which normally people normally, I would guess, confirm one day ahead of time. We do two, so it gives us time to fill in that block if someone cancels. We call the patient, try to make phone contact with them, and say, please wear PPE to the office. Um, if you're confused uh, or, or concerned about the COVID procedures here in the office, please go to our website. I give them the website, SalemIcareCenter.com. Please click on the COVID tab to explain to you what we're doing in this office to keep you safe and keep us safe. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So we have the automated system. We have an employee actually do it. But then we've gone back to the patients that we had to cancel because of the COVID. Say, hey, we're open. <laughs> We're here. Come on in. We're ready to take you. Um, you know, please again refer to the website. This explains everything that we're doing to keep you safe, that we can see you and can start care back to normal. Well, I've got to tell you, Heather, uh, this direct from the front lines insight is unlike anything we've gotten so far in the series. And I know that you have to get back to work uh, as your team needs you. So I'll just ask you this as we, you know, as you head back. Are there any things that during this conversation you thought, gosh, I'd love to tell this to a doctor or staff person who's on this line, and, and, and if not that, you know, any other closing comments? Be kind. Be kind. Help each other. Go out of your way. Make the extra effort. It's, if you want to be successful and you want to be caring and helpful to your patients and to your staff, just take the next step. Do something a little bit more than you may have. Thank you so much for giving us your time and perspective. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Have a great day. Got to run. All right. Bye. Well, Dr. Lippiat, I can see a substantial reason you're successful. You know, Heather's a great leader for your team. Um, as you guys have worked about, you know, bringing folks back, do you do an assessment of who can be best cross-trained? You know, who's got that ability that can do more than one thing? Tell us a little bit about how you're deciding who to bring, bring back and, and how. Oh, certainly in the beginning, um, that was a huge factor because as Heather mentioned, we were working with a, a smaller team. We needed uh, people to be able to jump from front desk to, to working up a patient. But over this entire process, what has become more apparent to us, Heather and I both, is this concept of this core team. So. Um, we really know where people stand as a result of the, of the COVID crisis. We know who we can really count on that. And you know what? I 
can train pretty much every anyone or for anything. Um, I have discovered that, you know, as much as I love trained, skilled people, I will take attitude over that any day of the week. And um, we've had to make some adjustments because, you know, some of our better trained people weren't our better core people, if that makes sense. So um, my, my learning was that I need people here at my table that I can count on. And, and that is really important. We uh, are going to shift the patient communications with a bit of the time that we have left. And Heather just mentioned SalemIcareCenter.com and the COVID information you have. You are trying to eliminate confusion and question by being very communicative and very straightforward. And while we've covered a bit of it in the past, this is new information for some of our attendees. Can you give us a sense of your protocol for both cleaning and how you are pushing information out to those that you need to feel safe when they come in? Yeah, um, and that's a great point. Heather talked about how we do some the train intense training um, when we bring a staff member back. About once a week, I work with the pretest staff myself to review how they're handling the exam room. And the way I phrase it is because I'm picking up exam rooms as well. Let's walk through this together. Again, I want to make sure you're not missing anything. I'm not missing anything. You show me what you do. I'll show you what how I'm doing it. And that way I, you know, it's really imperative to me as the business owner, doctor leader at this practice that we have no slippage. So I'm really maintaining that. Heather's maintaining it with front desk staff and, and optical staff out front. But our protocols are fairly stringent um, with no exceptions. The good thing is Ohio has opened up a little bit more, which is where we're at. So patients are used to going to doctor's offices, dentists now, veterinarians, um, at the store with masks. So masks have not been a problem. I would say if we have to deliver a mask to a patient once a day, maybe that, that would be a lot. Whereas in the beginning, we were handing out a lot of masks, even though we call and, and tell them. Heather mentioned that we have additional staff contacting patients ahead of time, we decided that we really wanted our schedule full because we were spacing. And we have found that our no-show rate is, is practically zero right now because we are contacting patients, we are reassuring them, and we are directing them to our website. Um, feedback from patients specifically has been the biggest reason they felt comfortable, one, our reputation, two, the information that we've been directing them to on our website, understanding what we've been done. So I think that's really key for patient comfort to feel comfortable coming back. Do you have any policy, this is a, a recently asked question, do you have any policy in your inform, information uh, to your patients about whether or not you want them to use their cell phones? Have you, have you developed a policy on that that you would share? Well, we've never allowed patients to use their cell phones in the exam room. We have signage everywhere. Are you are you referring to uh, waiting in the parking lot to to be admitted into the practice? Um, we we're not using the parking lot concept. I think it's a great concept. Um, we know most of our patients, and we have confirmed them ahead of time so much that we. We are expecting just that patient. Everything is 100% by appointment. So we're addressing people by name as, as they're entering in. Um, our parking lot is in the rear of our building. Our, our entrance is in the front, so it's a little awkward. We haven't run into problems. I've heard some stories of very much success with the parking lot check-in. So I fully agree with that method. If it's appropriate for your practice, I think it's a great way to go. And then, by the way, folks, there are some technologies out there that uh, you can look up. I, there's none recommended here that uh, provide even um, web platforms for patient check-ins, if that's what you want. Um, before we go to the next topic, another question related to advanced uh, time procedures. You talked a month ago that you weren't going to really be doing much with visual fields or long, you know, visits that are around dry eye management. How are you dealing with those today? How are you talking to your patients about something where the patient would otherwise need to be around for a while? 
So we're really critically examining the type of patients and being very strategic about our approach to returning patient care. We're starting with patients that have pent up demand. In other words, patients that requested to be the first back. We were working with those first. We're also looking at the schedule from recall to determine any patients that have specific needs, medical needs, that I would need to see them for. Those patients are being seen. Um, my feel right now is we have to keep the business of our practice surviving. So right now we are seeing patients with pent up demand, contact lens patients that need to get in here and get their eyes checked and get new, a new supply of contacts. We are seeing those patients first. We are currently delaying any chronic stable condition that would require additional testing like visual fields into late summer at this point. And we are seeing a lot of comprehensive exams. We're also really dealing with a new situation where we are um, seeing double the amount per week of new patients that we've ever seen in all these years. So it's interesting to me, but those patients are really needing to get in. So we do have pent up demand and it's been wonderful, but we're all working really hard as Heather said. Yeah, you know, my daughter's orthodontist sent out a note that in the seven weeks or so they were closed, they had to cancel 5,500 clinical visits. So, uh, you know, there is definitely pent up demand. Um, as it, one more question before we move on, and that is, you just hit on, you know, lots of uh, opportunity for eye exams. You had mentioned one of our uh, longtime listeners, Scott, said that in one of the first webinars, you said that you would reset your May goal to match approximately the number of eye exams performed in May 2019. How close will you come? We are right there. <laughs> I can't believe it. We are working hard. Um, I would say that one of the things that, you know, and you kind of touched on this with Heather, and I don't know that she knew um, what you were thinking exactly, but we've really gamified our approach to May and really have engaged the staff with our metrics in a way that maybe I hadn't in the past. So we do use um, analytics, we use edge analytics, and we know the number of patients we saw last year, we know our total revenue, we know our optical volume, we know our um, clinic volume, and we are paralleling it right now, which, is, which was our goal, and we are celebrating that, that we're meeting our goals. So we're real excited about that. We've got a, a little bit more time, so I'm gonna hit a couple other things that I think I would love for the team to hear. When you're wearing that mask all day, I mean, we're a very emotive profession. The way we connect with our patients is really, really different than many healthcare providers. You must have some stories about how it is to convey yourself to your patients and how the patients receive it. Can you talk a little bit about that, that new challenge of wearing a mask and seeing patients? Yeah, especially about like three or four o'clock um, in the day after you've been wearing it all day and you know your face is a big red blotchy thing underneath that thing. Um, one of the things that, um, one of the reasons I love practicing so much is my relationships with my patients. I know all the existing ones and um, I, I'm, we're getting a lot of new patients, so they're not able to see my face. And I have really modified my approach to greeting patients and instead of shaking their hands and some of my longtime older patients that um, I've seen for years will actually get out of the exam room as I walk in and give me a hug and that has all gone away. So, you know, one of the things that I do when I do greet a new patient is say, okay, now you're going to kind of learn what I do and you're going to learn how to read eyes. So I'm smiling with my eyes under my mask to you and welcome to the practice. Um, my older patients that I can't hug right now. We talk about it. One of the things that has amazed me is how emotional patients have become during this time. I've had, we, we do a lot of geriatrics here. It's just my patient demographic. And especially the first, we're only in week three and of, of this, these full day comprehensive care days. And a lot of my older patients will tell me that I am the first this is the first place that they have gone out of the house for outside of the grocery store. Some of them don't even go to the grocery store. And 
um, how nice it is to talk to someone outside of family and, and just their people that they have been talking to. I've also had patients literally have tears in their eyes telling me how much they miss physical touch, that no one has touched them in two and a half months. And I sit there and sometimes my eyes get teary too, because this is, this is really unprecedented at times, which then I would tell you um, brings me to the, the point of this time has really been important to the bonding process with patients in a way that I didn't do maybe before because we work pretty tightly here. And now with more spacing, um, patients are real anxious to tell their quarantine stories. They're real anxious to talk. And they're real anxious to listen. So it's 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 been a different period of time of practice, really. Have your patients taken your recommendations as much as ever? There's a lot of question early about whether we would, you know, have patients that have been financially impacted. Uh, how is the reception there going? So <clears throat> my approach, and this is what I told the staff, my approach is we we are here for a very specific purpose, the same purpose that we have been here for 31 years, and that's to, to provide the best comprehensive eye care we can possibly provide under any circumstance. That's the oath that I took to become an optometrist, and that's what we're doing. We are sensitive to um, always, always to patient, and we have solutions for different patients' financial situations, but I am not compromising care to um, accommodate a, a something I don't know. So we really haven't changed any of our recommendations that we've ever made before. Um, we have actually increased our patient revenue per exam significantly, um, uh, actually this uh, month by 16%. So we are making recommendations. I'll tell you, we've always recommended Blue Light. I talked to Blue Light with every patient that has expressed um, additional computer usage during this period of time. We are at right now for the month actual number 68% adoption of uh, blue light um, filters in lenses, which is good. And it we work on it every day. But truthfully, we have not people value their vision, especially during this time. And we are finding that to be true, as it's always been true, uh, vision is essential for everything that a person does. And people value that. They valued it before. They still value it now. And they are listening to solutions that I'm presenting, and they're uh, taking that advice. Let's do a few quick hitters, uh, get as many of these questions answered as we can from your perspective. If you were going to start to increase booking at a practice with two doctors, um, do you have any general thoughts about how to start to do that, say, in another month, uh, in terms of balancing the patient flow in the practice? Any quick thoughts on that? I do. It depends on your, uh, on your space. So we have a very large um, front reception area that can accommodate over 10 people comfortably. We have four exam rooms, two pretest rooms, special testing rooms. There are, this is all about spacing and safety and staffing. So I would say once you're comfortable with your staff, experiment, you start slow, you don't go from 10 patients a day to 20, that's never going to work. That will overwhelm staff. But a lot of it depends on your physical space and keeping people safe and having them believe their space, that they're safe as well. That's great. Um, during uh, the, you know, sort of bringing patients into the optical to get any eyewear service, do you book a patient, uh, you know, for something like that? Um, you know, do they come back if they've had an eye exam for dispensing a different time? Can you give a quick summary of how you're dealing with that part of the practice? Sure am. I'm still doing one-off hand uh with my optician. I walk. Um, some people bring the optician back to the room. I like to walk with the patient out to the optician and I actually say these words every time please have a seat behind the barrier so that, again, drawing attention to that uh, for that patient that we have provided safety uh, for them. Our opticians wear face shields, glasses, and masks. 
patient has on a mask. Now, for dispensing, I mentioned that, or Heather mentioned that we have brought back more optical help. In the beginning, there were nobody, there was hardly anybody. Once we, you know, dispense everything from the, the slow period, we didn't sell glasses for, what, five weeks. But now, um, we have dispensing, so those are scheduled. Um, we are spacing those out as well in the dispensary. Again, we have room, we have the space. So I think everybody's going to be different uh, in terms of their scheduling based on physical space. Um, you had mentioned, and I typed to a question earlier in the session, that you use an INR, a contact lens INR training software. Somebody wanted to know if you'd actually give the name of that software. Yeah, um, I can provide it to the GPN team. It's on our iPads. So I have done four of those now. I've never done one of them before. Um, and I actually just finalized the fourth uh, RX today. Um, it's working. I think we were spending a lot of time that we didn't need to, <laughs> to spend. Patients are pretty smart and uh, they're picking up, especially the motivated ones. So that method is working. I'll make sure I get that uh, to uh, GPN. You know how I always like to make sure those who stick around for the entire session get some value. So, you know, GPN Technologies is the deliverer of Edge Pro software. You've already mentioned it. This isn't a pitch. It's just a great tool by which you can analyze your practice. You have some important metrics around your practice in May so far. And I wonder if you could rattle off a few of those so the doctors could go back and make comparisons. Those that are open can make comparisons to their numbers. Can you give us some, some measurements? practice as we start to wrap up? Yeah, so I think um, in one of the webinars we did early on, I really shared the mes metrics of how far we were, were down for the year, year to date. Um, I will say that um, my expectation is that we will recover before the end of the year. We're currently overall business um, down 17%. That's an improvement from where we started. Um, for May, we're pretty much running even with May of 2019, which was actually a good month for us. So again, we are capturing that in uh, revenue per exam. So our revenue per exam is up. Our clinical revenue per exam is still down because remember, compared to last May, because we're still not at the volume that we were last May. Um, however, our optical revenue per exam is way up. It's actually over up over 50% for month to date, which is huge. Um, what we are doing are providing solutions for people that have problems. People have been home. They're using their vision more. They're on digital devices and solutions that solve those problems. And that's how we're doing it. That's amazing. So um, as we get to the end of this, I would like to give you the last conversation with the attendees. What kind of things do you want to mention and close as we think about this practical realities of reopening? So it was really nice to, to listen to Heather because, you know, we, we spent some, some hard times when she felt uncomfortable and I, I really, really needed to say to her, come back. You're, you're going to come back Monday. I let her know on the Wednesday before she was coming back um, Monday. Um, I think that everyone should uh, be sure to define your priorities for your practice and then act boldly. You need to act boldly. Don't worry about making mistakes because you're going to make them. I made a lot of mistakes and as I look back, I don't regret those mistakes because we've learned from them. Remember also, you're here to develop the best patient care. So you're going to have to figure out how to do that because patients are expecting it. When they walk in this practice, they're not expecting me to whine and cry about how much additional work and wearing PPP and all this stuff. Uh, they are expecting me to fix their problems. So um, like Heather said, we got to get over. That's patient care. And then finally, last slide, uh, don't be afraid to monitor your KPIs that are important to you. That is how I really engage the staff to stay motivated to, and I'm rewarding them. I'm rewarding them financially. I've been paying overtime for extended hours and working through lunch. I've been buying pizza for them for lunch today, in fact. Um, so you, you've got to do things to keep your staff okay, and it will be. It'll be fine. Well, throughout the course of this series, you've given us incredible practical insights, and I hope that the listeners got a 
real-time update as to how it's going and it, it's possible to be successful. So with that, I'm going to say thank you again, Dr. Lipiat, for your expertise and your time today. Thanks, Scott. Attendees, thanks for joining us. We hope that this has been of value and we look forward to presenting to you another day in the near future. Until then, be great at all you do.